I'm going to go ahead and uh, and uh, make this live and and uh, so that you guys can see my entire screen up here. I'm joined by Nicole Hall with us today, who's going to monitor questions as they come through on things. So feel free to ask questions in that panel on the right-hand side of your screen, where you can see stuff and you can type in a question. We'll read it out loud and we'll answer any questions you might have. Again, my name is Jamie Turner. I am the author of How to Make Money with Social Media. I'm also the Chief Content Officer at BKV 60 Second Marketer, which is an online magazine for the marketing community around the globe. Uh, on your screen right now, you should be seeing a screen that says how to measure the ROI of a social media campaign. I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch over to the next screen, which now is a brief introduction of who I am. I'm the Chief Content Officer, as I mentioned, at 60 Second Marketer, which is an online magazine brought to you by BKV Digital and Direct Response. I've helped AT&T, CNN, Coca-Cola. I'm not going to go through reading all these. I always get embarrassed when I see this stuff, and it gets a little too uh, self-aggrandizing. Uh, self, um, so bottom line is, though, I'm an expert, theoretically, in social media and have written a book on it and have a lot of information about how to measure social media. The reason I'm doing this presentation is because people are out there to this day saying you can't measure the success of a social media campaign on an ROI basis. And these are social media gurus, and I put gurus in quotes there. That's totally not true. You can measure the success of a social media campaign based on specific ROI metrics. Some of you listening on this call today are going to be familiar with some of the formulas we're going to talk about, the math that we're going to review. Others, it's going to be a little bit new. In any case, you can download this presentation at 60secondmarketer.com slash PDF, as in PDF, the things that you download, uppercase P, uppercase D, uppercase F. One thing to remember is this is not a webinar. This is a training session. So please feel free to type the questions uh, in the box on your screen. Have at it. Type away questions so that you can tell us what's going on, what's on your mind, questions that are specific to you. We really specifically want to make sure that folks ask questions on this because there's so much information to go through. But I want to make sure this is particularly relevant to the people who have been invited to this. Now, as you guys know, I invited only a handful of people to this actual seminar because I wanted to make sure we had time to answer any questions that come through. So feel free to answer those questions. The starting point for any discussion on social media is to take a look at the evolution of marketing and the evolution of social media. On your screen right now, you should be seeing something called the Gartner Hype Cycle. And the Gartner Hype Cycle, Gartner Group, of course, is a group of people, a technology consulting firm and research firm that goes in and analyzes different things on the technology front. And they went back and they said, man, social media and so many other things are such a big hit right now. Why don't we go back and analyze and figure out what happens whenever a new technology is introduced into the marketplace? And they found that the same thing happens every time. And the first thing that happens is there's a technology trigger. So in the bottom part of your screen, you should be seeing down here this little technology trigger. Something happens that goes on that gets people to start using something. For example, years ago it was blogging. All of a sudden, people were able to update websites on a daily basis, and they started out as something called a web log, which ultimately turned into a blog. Well, then what ends up happening is the technology goes through the peak of inflated expectations, which is where people start realizing, hey, wait a second here. We're going to start using blogging as the example as something that's going to really change. We're going to get the CEO to you as a blog, the CFO is going to have a blog, all that stuff. And all technologies go through the peak of inflated expectations. Then they go through what's called the trough of disillusionment. And what happens there is people start going, you know what? Why is the CEO blogging? Why are we doing that? Why is the CFO got a blog? Shouldn't they be doing something different than that? And then after a little while, technologies go through the slope of enlightenment and the plateau of productivity. So basically what happens is, all technologies go through this cycle right here. What's interesting is that social media right now is here. It's way overhyped. It's overdone. Everybody thinks it's going to be the end-all, be-all. I'm here to tell you right now, it's a great tool. It's one of many tools in the marketer's tool chest. But what's going to happen in the course of 2011 is this trough is going to happen, and people are going to start going, hey, wait a second. What's going to happen is there's going to be a knock on the door. The CFO is going to come out and say, hey, tell me that we spent – this amount of money in our social media campaign, show me the money where I can see that it generated revenue for our corporation. And the vast majority of marketers aren't going to be able to say 
Yes, we tracked it. Yes, we can show you how it generated revenue for us. That's what we're here to talk about today. It's the kind of thing BKV does for corporations all over the planet, ranging from AT&T to the Home Depot to Equifax to a lot of different corporations, is figuring out ways to track data and digital information and then figure out how to use that data and information to show that, hey, we actually did generate a positive ROI on this. So let's keep going on this. Here's the percentage of marketers that are using social media today and what tools they're using. You can see that um, YouTube is used by 65% of all marketers, Facebook by 74% of all marketers, LinkedIn by 60%, and Twitter by another percentage there. And basically the bottom line is, is that you can figure out that large corporations are starting to say, hey, guess what? I am using social media because it's effective. Now, the bad news is, is that most of them have just thrown up their YouTube channel, their Facebook page, their LinkedIn profile, their Twitter account, and aren't figuring out actually how to use this properly. Well, any discussion on social media has to start with an understanding of how people make buying decisions. So that's what we're going to talk about first. A lot of you are going to be familiar with some of the things that we're going to talk about here, but not a long time ago, in the 1960s, somebody came up with a consumer response model called AIDA, and most people are familiar with that. It's attention. It's where people get attention for a product or service. They then have interest, then desire, then action. These other models over here to the right are updated versions of AIDA. We're not going to go into the details on them because we already know. Basically, the bottom line is people get attention, they have interest, they have desire, then they take action on what you want to do. Again, this presentation is available at 60secondmarketer.com slash PDF if you want to download an extended version of this. Please feel free to do that. Well, here's some interesting stuff on how people make buying decisions. The vast majority of buying decisions are actually made emotionally and rationalized logically. So people buy stuff for emotional reasons, and then they go back and backtrack and then rationalize their purchase logically. A great case study on that is a study done by Baylor University with Coke and Pepsi. They basically went into a room, had 100 people in the room. They said, hey, guess what? We're going to go in and we're going to type in, we're going to go in and do a blind taste test for uh, Coke and Pepsi. 100 people in the room, they aren't going to know which one they're picking. They just are going to tell us which one they like the flavor better of. So they go in, they do the room. Guess what they came up with? 50-50 exactly 50-50 that came out and they said, hey, you know what? Um, uh, the, uh, we, we, uh, we, we have 50% of the room liking Coke, 50% liking Pepsi. Now, they went to the same group of people, said, all right, take those blind taste tests off your chairs and tables there. Now we want you to go in and we're going to give you a Coca-Cola in a Coke can. We're going to give you a Pepsi in a Pepsi can. Now we want you to try it and tell us which one you like better. Same group of people, but this time they had 80% of the people picking Coca-Cola. Now why is that? Why is it that in a room where a blind taste test came through and it was 50-50, it came out 80-20 for Coca-Cola? Well, sometimes it's the marketplace that they're doing the test, and other times when it's that dramatic, you know that basically it's the emotional content behind drinking Coca-Cola. I'm going to ask those of you on our, on our uh, webinar today to answer this question to yourself. Write down the list of things, or just think out loud. What are the things I associate with Coca-Cola? What are the images that I associate with Coca-Cola? And the bottom line is you're going to come up with things like polar bear, mean Joe green, I'd like to teach the world to sing, all that stuff, Santa Claus, all that stuff that goes back deep in our emotional psyche. Do the same thing for Pepsi. I'm going to give you a second. What's the first thing that pops in your mind when you think about Pepsi? I bet it's Michael Jackson's hair catching on fire, or Britney Spears, or Madonna. Something that's not at all deeply rooted in our psyche. But the bottom line is, what we know is that 80% of the time people were choosing Coke in the non-blind study. Why? Because of the emotional context behind Coca-Cola. Because of the emotional stuff that happens deep down inside of us, subconsciously, that we associate with Coca-Cola. Think about it. Coca-Cola owns Santa Claus. How much better can it get? Who does Pepsi own? Michael Jackson, Madonna, Britney Spears. You tell me which is more deeply ingrained in the American psyche, and you know what the answer to that is. It's Santa Claus. So now let's take a look at what happens emotionally in the female brain versus the male brain when all that stuff is going on. Well, they've done research, 
As we know, the right hemisphere in all of our brains is the creative side of the brain, and the left hemisphere is the logical side of the brain. What they also know is that there's 25% more connections between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere in the female brain. So what ends up happening is women are much better at communicating, they're better at multitasking, they're better at being in touch with their feelings because the right hemisphere is doing a much better job of communicating with the left hemisphere. So that makes women, their brains actually function very, very, probably a little bit better. Now let's take a look at the male brain and what's going on in the male brain. Well, the male brain, as you can see, a little simpler, a little bit more, you know, kind of, male brain focuses on basically three things. Is the beer cold? Is the game on? And am I going to get busy tonight? And if those three things are going to happen, that male brain is very, very happy. But the bottom line is what they found, if we go back to how people make buying decisions, is the female brain has 25% more connections between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. The result of that is that they're much better at communicating, much better at talking things out, much better at multitasking than men, men are. So how does social media fit in all this? Well, social media enables you to open up a dialogue with prospective customers. When you have a dialogue with a prospective customer, they grow to trust you. Once they trust you, they're more likely to buy your product or service. That's the key reason all of this relates to social media. Now, we did have a question, and I'm encouraging you guys to ask questions over there on the right-hand side of this. The question is, is this webinar being uh, recorded? Yes, it is. We should be able to upload it and have a link available for you to read and or revisit this in the future. So keep those uh, cards and letters coming, folks, over there on the right-hand side so that you can have questions coming in. So I'd ask everybody on the webinar today to ask themselves, what are you really selling? What is it that you're really selling? All of this is ultimately going to relate to how to generate an ROI with social media, but you've got to go through the fundamentals first. So what is it that you're really selling? Well, what you think you're selling may be very different from what you're actually selling. A health club isn't selling fitness. They're selling, of course, self-esteem, sex appeal, and a longer life. A restaurant isn't selling food. They're selling camaraderie, escape from the ordinary, and freedom. And a mortgage broker isn't selling low interest rates. They're selling trust, confidence, in a seamless transaction. So for everybody that's listening to this right now, I want you to think back and go, what is it that I'm really selling? I know what I'm selling on the surface, but what am I selling deep down inside? What's the hidden need that I'm selling? So let me give you another example. When somebody goes in and buys a Porsche, on the surface, they're buying a sports car. Deep down inside, what are they really buying? Well, it's typically a male, and that male is typically in their 40s. That male's trying to have sex appeal. They're trying to feel younger. They're trying to feel vibrant. They're trying to feel successful. Those are the real things that Porsche sells. All of the folks on this call, pretty, logic, pretty sophisticated marketers, you're going to know what it is you're selling. But I'd encourage you to go deep and go think, what is it really deep down inside that I'm selling? Well, let's take a look at how marketing worked in the old days. In the 20th century, marketing was pretty simple. You ran a TV commercial, and in fact, in 1965, you could run three TV commercials, one on each network, and reach during prime time and reach 80% of the viewing audience. 1965, three prime time TV commercials, you'd reach 80% of the viewing audience. Very, very simple. My dad was a madman, worked on Madison Avenue, worked side by side with David Ogilvie. So they basically would go run a TV campaign and be done with it. It's no wonder they had three martini lunches. They didn't have anything else to do all day long. Today's world is much, much more complex. This young lady right here, she's interested in perfume. She decides, hey, I'm going to go out and Google perfume. Well, what happens for her? All of a sudden, she Googles the perfume she's interested in, and all these little things are all interconnected. If that perfume is smart and they're on board with all these different social media tools, then they're able to engage with that woman and, better yet, drive that person through to their website and convert them from a prospect to a customer. That's great news. If they're not in all these places, then that woman doesn't find them on Google, goes out and looks for another perfume that is on, on Google in all these social media places. So let's take a look at social media use by the 18 to uh, 65 plus segment. The 18 to 29 year olds are near saturation. You can see in this chart in the upper right hand side here, it's about 90% of the 18 to 29 year olds are using social media. 
the 65 plus segment, interestingly enough, is the fastest growing segment. They're growing at a faster rate than the 18 to 29 segment because the 18 to 29 segment is pretty much saturated right now. But the 65 plus segment is embracing social media. So if those of you who are on the webinar today have uh, audiences that skew a little bit older, good news is grandma's on Facebook. Why is she on Facebook? Because her children and grandchildren are on Facebook too. And she knows that her grandchildren don't even have email accounts. They communicate via Facebook or Twitter or any of the other things that are out there. So if she wants to talk to them, she's got to go on that. That's why it's growing so, so quickly. So let's take a look at whether or not social media would be right for you. I do a lot of consulting and talking about social media around the globe. I basically start out with the same question every time. Don't get into social media until you've asked yourself a couple of fundamental questions. Well, do you want to attract new customers to your business? Most everybody says yes. Social media is right for you if you want existing customers to come back more frequently, or if you want an inexpensive way to connect with customers, or if you want customer feedback on a new product or service, or if you want to cross-promote one part of your business with another part of your business, or if you want to increase brand loyalty, or if you want to differentiate your brand from your competitor's brand. The bottom line is social media is great for all of these things. Now, for those of you, I don't want you to think that I always push social media. I don't. I had a guy call me the other day. And he said, hey, Jamie, I'm in, a, I, I'm in a franchise operation, and we do windshield repair. And I forget the name of the company. We'd all be familiar with it. And he said, I, I want to get into social media because I, I keep hearing all this stuff about it. Should I do it? And I said, you know what? You shouldn't. It's not right for your business. Why? Because people don't think about windshield repair until they get a cracked windshield. The bottom line is nobody's going to go friend you on Facebook. Nobody's going to want to follow your tweets. Nobody's going to want to even read your blog because you're blogging about windshield repair, which I don't care about until I need you. What you do want is to be in paid search and be in all those things that can put that phone number right in front of somebody so that when they do Google broken windshield, they can go in and find you that way. So I don't always say that social media is right for everybody, but if you are one of the people who finds that these bullet points are relevant to you on that slide, then you're going to want to get into social media. So let's talk and do an overview how the Fortune 500 make money with social media, because if you can understand that, you can understand an awful lot. Now again, this uh, uh, webinar is, is being recorded. Hopefully we'll be able to send you a link where you can get it. You can also download this at 60secondmarketer.com slash PDF, and it's sponsored by BKV Digital and Direct Response. BKV does uh, large-scale digital and direct response programs for AT&T, Home Depot, Equifax, the American Red Cross, Mercedes-Benz, Caterpillar, large corporations who are interested in generating leads and converting those prospects into customers. When I wrote my book called How to Make Money with Social Media, I went through and said, well, what are the models that are out there? And believe it or not, there are only five models out there for how businesses make money with social media. The first is branding. Branding uses that, that these are companies that use social media as a branding tool to just build awareness and connect with customers. A lot of folks would be familiar with the Toyota Sienna family. It's just a YouTube little mini campaign. They've got their own channel. They've got, I think, 23 different videos up there. They went in and they did these little snippets of this quirky, funny family. Last time I checked, which was about a month ago, they had 7 million impressions for watching this YouTube commercial. In order to generate 7 million impressions on primetime TV, you'd have to spend about a million bucks in order to do that. So that is a very tangible way that Toyota could go into the CFO and say, hey, look, we just saved ourselves a million bucks because we didn't have to spend that money on uh, traditional media channels. The best example, of course, is the... Uh, 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 cologne that came out over the summer with a big, huge social media campaign, uh, Old Spice, did a campaign, 130 million views on that campaign. Also, they had, um, uh, they had uh, 130 million views, and they also had an increase in sales of 100% versus the year before, 105% to be more specific. Somebody wrote in and said the download at 60secondmarketer.com slash PDF is not working for me right now. Will it be available later? Yes, it will. Be sure that you typed in uppercase P, uppercase D, uppercase F. It should be available there. I'm surprised it's not, but I'll double check it uh, later on. But sometimes people have a little bit of difficulty with it. Just keep trying on that. So the second way that social media is uh, good for 
uh, the Fortune 500 use social media to generate sales and revenues through e-commerce. Dell has a fascinating model. I talked to the guy who figured this out. His name is Roberto, great guy. He went in and he said, hey, I'm going to try to see if we can use Dell outlet in order to generate sales and revenue using that social media channel. So they went in and they created a Twitter account. It was one of the very first Twitter accounts called Dell Outlet. They started tweeting about technology things so that people who were interested in computers and things like that would go and follow Dell Outlet. Well, what ended up happening is very rapidly they ended up having 1.5 million followers on their Dell Outlet Twitter account. What they do is they go out, and this is a real specific model, so you've got to follow this. They go out and they do tweets once a day, once every other day, that are special offers just for people who are following them on Dell Outlet. And the tweet will say something like, hey, get 20% off a laptop computer for the next 24 hours by clicking this link. Now, when they go out and they have 1.5 million followers and they say, hey, guess what? We're going to give you a 20% discount on the, on, the, on, the, uh, on the computers. Let's do some math here. Bottom line is 1.5 million followers. Well, 1.5 million people don't see that tweet. Let's be real conservative. Let's say only 50,000 people see that tweet out of 1.5 million. Okay, that's fair enough. How many of those people actually then click through on that link that goes to the landing page? Let's say only 500 click through. That's okay. That's cool. We got 500 people on a landing page that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Well, let's say out of that 500, we get a 1% conversion rate. So that's 50 people, and that would be a 1% convert. That, that, anyway, 50 people would be uh, out of 500. I'm trying to do the math in my brain. I'm looking over at Nicole going, did I do the math right there? And I, anyway, long story short, out of 500 people, we get 50 people to buy the product. Let's make the math simple because clearly my brain's not ready to do the math crunching while I'm talking today. Math simple, let's say it's a $1,000 computer. They just generated $50,000 out of that number of people by doing a tweet just for doing a tweet. So the bottom line, and I know now it's a 10%. Okay, I got it. <laughs> it's all coming together for me, folks. But let's say it was a 1% uh, conversion rate. That means 50, 500 people, and they got five people to buy the product based on that. That's still five grand every time you do a tweet. Guess how much money they generate every, last time I saw the statistics on this, it was like three to four million dollars a year just using this Dell Outlet Twitter uh, account. So really, really great model. One to be familiar with. We'll talk about it again in a little bit. Research, another great way to use social media. Fortune 500 goes out and they say, hey, let's go out and figure out what our customers are interested in. Starbucks does this with MyStarbucksIdea.com where people can come in and share ideas on how to improve Starbucks, vote on the ideas that they like, discuss the ideas, and then see the ideas as they go through. Really, really cool stuff going on there. Also, customer retention. A lot of us that are familiar with all this stuff say, hey, we get customers who come in. We also get customers who depart. How do we prevent that from happening? Well, Frank at Comcast went in. He opened up a Twitter account and said, I'm going to start seeing what people are saying about Comcast on Twitter. Well, what do you think when Frank went to search.twitter.com, that's search.twitter.com, and typed in tw uh, Comcast? What do you think he saw? Good stuff about Comcast? Nope. Not good stuff about Comcast. And he went in and he said, hey, guess what? I'm going to reach out to these people, communicate to them via Twitter, and try to help solve their problem from a customer service point of view. And it worked. And people started saying, wow, this guy's monitoring what we're saying about Comcast on Twitter. Isn't that cool? He's able to hear what we're saying, and he's able to help me out, give me special phone numbers, help me reboot my cable modem, all that stuff that is really, really important. And when you understand that getting a new customer costs three to five times as much as retaining an, an existing customer. That's very tangible numbers that you can go into the CFO and go, hey, our churn last year was 5% of our, client, our customers leave us every year. We reduced it to 4% because we went in and were able to prevent the churn from happening because we know that we used social media to help people along and improve their engagement with our brand. Well, a lot of you are saying, hey, I'm not a business-to-consumer product. I'm a business-to-business -business product. How do I use social media there? Well, you use this model that I've got here. It's called the hub-and-spoke model. And the bottom line is we use for BKV, my parent company, BKV Digital and Direct Response, we use all these things 
to drive people through to engage them with BKV. So we have the 60 Second Marketer website that I run, our YouTube channel for 60 Second Marketer, speeches I do, events, blog postings, books, online seminars and webinars, mobile media, we've got a website, ebooks, Twitter, forums, an e-newsletter that comes out every Friday. The bottom line is, is you can we use that as a way to reel in people and introduce them to BKV and introduce the kinds of things that BKV is doing. What's cool about this model is it's not our model. You can have it. You can share it. Use the same hub and spoke model for yourself. Develop your own series of spokes that you can use to drive people through to your product or your service or a landing page on your website where you can convert those people from a prospect to a customer. This is a picture of the 60 Second Marketer homepage where you can see, hey, bottom line is we use BKV. We kind of prominently display BKV, but mostly we provide great information about marketing to people so that they can go in and get engaged with us. And then we go ahead and track that and re-market to them and say to them, hey, we want to talk to you a little bit more in depth about BKV if you're interested. So remember, Use this lead generation model. Your company can be in this middle section here. It doesn't just have to be BKV's model. You can use it too in order to generate prospects that you can convert into customers. Now let's talk real quickly about a social media overview. Let me tell you, social media is not just the big five, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and MySpace. And MySpace wouldn't even really be considered one of the big five anymore. Bottom line is social media goes way beyond that and gets into a bunch of other things, including blogs, bookmarking and tagging, content aggregation, crowdsourcing and voting, discussion boards and forums, events and meetups, photo sharing, podcasting, all these different things. This bottom one down here, number 14, email marketing. That's something that's often overlooked, but it's a great way to engage with prospects and keep them in the loop and keep sending them information about your product or service so that you can reel them in. Any program that uses, let's say, that hub and spoke model that we talked about a minute ago should always be using as many of these as they possibly can in order to capture the data about your prospect so that you can convert them into a lead. Well, let's talk about social media tools and techniques and the different ones that are out there. Again, if you start looking, when I was writing the book, I said, hey, what are the categories of social media tools that I can divide things up into? And the first is networking tools, tools that basically help you network with other people or other products and services. The second is tools that you can use to promote your product or service. And the third category is tools that you can use to share information. So the networking tools include MySpace, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. Those are the kinds of things that you can go out and kind of just stir things up. If you're in sales, you'll want to be using these tools a lot. If you're a larger corporation that's trying to generate leads, you're still going to want to be using these tools for your company. Other tools that are tools that help you promote. YouTube channels as used by companies using social media to generate sales and revenue. Basically, you set up your own YouTube channel where people can go through and watch a YouTube video about your product or service. A couple of tips on that front. Make sure when the CEO comes in and says, hey, I did my annual report last uh, at the annual meeting, and we have a 20-minute video of me doing my speech. Let's upload it to our YouTube channel. You just escort the CEO out and say that's not what the YouTube channel is for. YouTube channel is to give interesting, relevant information to people in small bits and pieces that are going to make them want to engage with you further. So resist the temptation to just throw up a YouTube video that you think, hey, here's our summer party and we videotaped it. Don't do that. Go in and do short, quick, 60-second videos that provide tips and information that are relevant to the person that you're trying to attract. Final category is tools that help you share. SlideShare is a great tool. Blogging, of course. Yelp is a great tool. Dig and Delicious. Those are all tools that basically help you share information about your product or service, and you can kind of go through that. So now let's get down to the meat of the matter, which is how to measure a social media campaign. Again, when I wrote how to make money with social media, I went and I said, well, let me categorize these things. I'm a great simplifier. Things get confusing out there, and I go, man, I can't even keep track of all this stuff, as you could see a minute ago when I couldn't figure out that 50 was 10% of 500. But the bottom line is I'm always trying to simplify stuff from my mind. And I broke it out into three different categories, quantitative metrics, qualitative metrics, and ROI metrics. On the quantitative front, that's one of the categories of measurement of social media. Those are just quantitative. It's just data. Facebook fans, Twitter followers, unique page views, email sign-ups, all that stuff. It's just data. 
all that stuff that says, hey, we're tracking on the right direction. We're getting more than we had last month. The second category is qualitative. That's the touchy-feely stuff. That's survey responses to open-ended questions. That's customer feedback. That's brand sentiment. We're going to talk in a minute about ways to measure qualitative metrics. And then the final is ROI. All roads in social media should lead to ROI. We're in business. We are not doing social media to be social. We're doing social media to make money. So if you're not sitting there saying everything I do should be designed to generate money in the long run for me, then you shouldn't be in social media from a business perspective. So all roads lead to ROI. And that involves marketing mix models, conversions, and net present value, customer lifetime value, and, and all that stuff that are kind of the formulas that are involved in the ROI side of the equation. So let's take a look at some of the quantitative metrics and the ways you can measure quantitative. Well, you can go into Google Analytics. A lot of you are using Google Analytics to measure traffic to your blog. That's terrific. You can measure the traffic to the blog. If you're really a larger corporation and you want to get into more in-depth things, you're going to want to do quantitative things like Adobe Online Marketing Suite. That's a real in-depth program that costs a little bit of money, but it's worth it if you want to get into the deep stuff. And then, of course, Eloqua, which is a great tool, marketing automation. Basically, Eloqua, if you're not familiar with it, all of us who are trying to generate prospects for a company go in and they say, hey, we, if, if we have a prospect who comes in for the first time to our website, we want them to have a different experience than somebody who comes into our website for the fifth time and is ready to buy. They're further down in the sales funnel. So how do we change our website based on that? Well, Eloqua is a system that helps you basically figure that stuff out. And it goes in and says, hey, Nicole's here for the first time. We're going to give her the simple stuff. We're going to give her the easy stuff that's easy to digest, only because we don't want to overwhelm her with the in-depth pricing stuff. But we look over here, and Nancy's here for the fifth time. Last time she was here, she signed up for our e-newsletter. She's deep down in the, in the sales funnel. Now we're ready to serve up a, a page when she comes in that's got pricing information, sales contact information, all that stuff. Really, really cool tool that you can use to measure not only traffic, but also engage people much more in depth. Quantitative, another quantitative metric is online chatter. Basically you go in and just kind of type into search.twitter.com your company, your product, find out what people are saying about you, which is really, really a terrific way to do it. You can also use a bunch of other tools to measure online chatter, including social mention. There's a bunch of them out there and they'll basically crunch the data for you, tell you what's going on and give you some really, really good metrics on that. Another thing that you want to measure is the breadth of engagement. What social media tools are we in? If we're going to use that hub and spoke model that I mentioned earlier, which one of those spokes are we going to be in? Let's start out with four and build up to eight and even 12 after that. But we want to be in as many as we can realistically manage and monitor. One of the key questions I always get is, hey, how, much, how, how deep should we go in? How much breadth should we have in our engagement? Start with a blog and an e-newsletter and build out from there. And of course, you're going to want to have your LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter uh, pages up. But the bottom line is use those as the fundamental thing that you're going to use in order to build this. Another quantitative metric, leads generated. How many people came in? How many of them were real leads that I could use to convert to customers or clients? That's what you want to measure. If you can show that money, show, that, show those leads generated and how many of them converted, you're able to show the money to the CFO and let them know, hey, the bottom line is we're doing this for real and we're tracking and measuring the stuff that we're doing. Another metric is uh, on the quantitative side is organic search rankings. Hey, where are we on our organic search? When people type in keywords that are important to us, where do we come up? That's a real quantitative metric. Hey, we used to be on page 10. Now we're on page 3. Pretty soon we're going to be on page 1. Very, very valuable information. Quantitative, another uh, metric is depth of engagement. How long do people spend on my site? You can go to compete.com, which is where this chart uh, came from, and basically type in different companies that you want to find out how long people are, are doing it. And I went in and did it for YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and you can see how long people are staying on each one of those channels on average. The average stay on YouTube is 18 minutes. My gosh, it's no wonder nobody gets any work done anymore. Quantitative depth of engagement, bottom line is you can go down to the bottom there and see something called Wibia. On our website we have that and basically it tracks a lot of different things and gives me data on how engaged people were with the website as we went through. Other quantitative met metrics include inbound links, social bookmarks, 
likes on Facebook, ebook downloads, ratings, if you have people rate uh, different things, participation in polls, content entries, new, new e-newsletter subscribers, e-newsletter unsubscribers, how many people are dropping off the back end? That's always something you want to look at. And then the bounce rate, how many people come into your website and immediately bounce out to another page or after a minute, staying there for a minute. You want them, the bounce rate to be as low as possible because you want people to engage across multiple pages on your website. Um, let's talk about, take a look at qualitative metrics. Those are the things that have an emotional content to them. Well, you can do polls, questions, and customer feedback on um, your qualitative stuff. So I went into the Tide website recently and, uh, and basically found out that, uh, hey, Tide, when I go there, puts up something that says, hey, we want to hear what you're, why you're here. What are you visiting us for? Please take the survey and we can figure that out. And that's a great way to kind of engage with Tide or have Tide get information on qualitative metrics for their, um, uh, what they do. You can also just do simple ones on your Facebook page or your LinkedIn page. You see this on our LinkedIn group. What three mobile phone apps would you recommend to others? A great way to go in and, uh, and engage with people because we wanted to find out what, for our people who are following us on LinkedIn, what, what, what would they suggest because we were writing a blog post called the Top 100 Mobile Phone Applications for Business. If you go to the 60 Second Marketer and just type in Top 100 into the search box, that'll come up. You can also do the same thing on Facebook and engage people there and do all that sort of stuff. Also, you want to do uh, these uh, new tools that are coming out, polls that go on in the inside of the page, suggestion bars that go over on the right-hand side, lots of different ways to get qualitative metrics. Of course, you can go outside to companies like RapLead, which will go in and they'll analyze basically what people are saying about you online. They'll be able to tell you what people are feeling about your brand. If 70% of the people call your product cheap and 30% call it inexpensive, well, that's a real specific thing that you want to know about, and you want to know that, hey, we want to reverse that trend and get more people calling us inexpensive than call us cheap. Another way to get brand sentiment is a great tool called uh, SM2, which is basically from Alterian, and you can go in and, and they'll do the same kind of thing that Rapleaf would do, basically kind of figure out what people are saying about your product or service. And then finally, uh, another brand sentiment tool is Nielsen. If you got a bundle of bucks to spend and you really want to go deep, you go to Nielsen. Great information, great in-depth studies, uh, but not cheap. Um, qualitative, another one is, uh, is in, uh, Social Radar, which is a great tool. They've got a freemium version as well as a premium version, and you can check that out. All those are basically tools that can be used to measure things on, an, are on a, a qualitative basis, which is always important. But the real thing is, we always said we want to get down to the ROI. We want to get down to the bottom line here. So what is the bottom line for ROI in terms of social media metrics? A lot of you are going to be familiar with customer lifetime value. Um, if you aren't, uh, listen in. If you are, uh, bear with us as we go through customer lifetime value because that's a critical component for how you end up using social media to measure the effectiveness of it. But the first thing to understand is the Dell model. Dell goes out, and over here on the left-hand side, you see all these different social media tools that they use in order to stir things up out there. A lot of them drive through to the Dell Outlet Twitter page. They then go out and they use all of that stuff to drive people through to a landing page where the people can go in and say, uh, uh, okay, cool, got it, now this works out really, really well. I can go ahead and convert those prospects to customers. It's an important metric out there in terms of measuring it. Everything should lead to profits, though. The bottom line is you've got to measure it on an ROI basis so that the people can, who knock on your door and say, show me the money, you can say, here's how we did it. Well, we're going to talk about calculating customer lifetime value. I'm going to use a, a uh, model here for Scott Flonk here. I don't work with Scott's. I don't know anything about Scott's, but it was just a good, easy way to kind of explain customer lifetime rev, uh, value and how to use that as a model to predict whether or not your social media campaign is generating revenue. Well, a simplified version of customer lifetime value is the revenue generated by a customer during his or her lifetime with your brand. So the customer lifetime value, for example, for Scott Lawn Care would look like this. The average customer is spending 80 bucks per month. They stay 12 months of the year. They pay that. The average customer spends three years with us before they go out and decide that they aren't going to work with us anymore, they move or whatever. So the customer lifetime value for Scott's lawn care is $2,880.
We know that. That's cool. That's how much money that customer is going to bring us when we bring that customer in. So what's our allowable cost per sale? And by the way, I, BKV does this for companies all over the globe. This is the model that BKV uses to generate revenue for various companies. So it's something that they're very familiar with, something I'm familiar with, and a lot of you on that call right now would probably be familiar with, but maybe not. Allowable cost per sale is how much money are we going to spend in order to generate that $2,880? Well, typically, it's going to be about 10% of your customer lifetime value. I'll spend 288 bucks to generate $2,880. When I know that, then I can start going in and saying, all right, well, how do we spend that money? Well, let's say Scott uses um, direct mail as their primary lead generation tool. Well, they know that if they send out 200 pieces of direct mail and get a half a percent conversion rate, they get one new customer for every 200 pieces that they send out. Well, if it costs a buck 44 per piece to send out, then they, and that's pretty high, by the way, but it, let's say it costs a buck 44 per piece. They know that they send out 200 pieces, and that generate that means it's 288 bucks for every customer that they get, which is perfect because that's their allowable cost per sale. Well, that means for every one customer they get, they spend 288 bucks. Well, how does that work out on a big scale? Well, they spend $2.8 million. That generates 2 million pieces of direct mail a year, which is half a percent conversion. That's 10,000 new customers per year for Scott's. How does all this relate to social media? Well, we sit down and we go, all right, well, now we know what works in direct mail. Let's test that against social media. So we go in and we say, let's take 10% of that and use it as a social media test. We're going to take 280 grand and test the social media campaign. Now, our social media campaign for Scott's going to be pretty in-depth. It's not just throwing up a YouTube channel and all that stuff. It's pretty in-depth. We're going to put two or three people on it internally to handle Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, blogging, our e-newsletter, and our landing pages. We're going, to, we're going to really put that. Well, the labor for that's 140 grand per year, bottom line. Well, our production, we've got to produce videos. We've got to produce new landing pages. We've got to produce all this new stuff that happens when we do all this, uh, all these things and convert these people. Well, that's going to be a hundred grand. Well, and then we'll throw in a miscellaneous forty grand for the big party at the end of the year that we have when we know that this thing worked. The total is two hundred and eighty grand for a relatively robust social media campaign. Well, how does all that play out? Well, we know that if we spend two hundred and eighty thousand dollars in direct mail, we know from our statistics that that will generate 1,000 new customers. So if we spend 280 grand in social media, all we have to do is generate 1,000 customers from that, track them through on a landing page specific to the social media campaign, see how many of them converted to customers, and if I can get 1,000, I know I've got success. If I can even get 800, let's say, I know that I'm basically building a new model that can generate more and more leads and prospects as I go on. So 800 year one might translate to 900 in year two, might translate to 1,000 in year three. As we get more and more efficient at what we do, our costs drop down and our ability to attract these people goes up. Now here's what's really cool. Customer lifetime value increases when you use social media. So for example, if let's say you're in the cruise business or you're in uh, the vacation rentals business, or whatever business you're in, the more people are engaged with your brand, the higher their customer lifetime value because they stay engaged with you after they've purchased your product. And they go in and they say, hey, you know what? I'm staying engaged with these people. And that prevents them from going to another competitor all through social media. So that's the fundamental model for social media. If you understand that and you start using it, then you can all of a sudden start going in when the CFO knocks on your door and say, hey, guess what? I can track our social media because we sat through this webinar, learned the quantitative, qualitative, and ROI metrics that, and tracking mechanisms that are out there, and then we're tracking this on a specific customer lifetime value basis. And because of that, we're able to do it properly. So let's talk about what's next, what's coming down the pike. Well, the big stuff coming down the pike, of course, is mobile, Android, Blackberry, iPhone, Palm Pre, and what's been renamed as uh, uh, Windows. It's not Windows Mobile anymore, it's, uh, but, but long story short, is there's five different operating systems out there that are the primary ones that you're going to want to be familiar with. And there are different ways that you can use social mobile media in order to engage people. And if you want to know what my next book is going to be, it's going to be called How to Make Money with Mobile Media. But there's a bunch of different ways you can use mobile media to engage people. One is SMS. That's just normal texting. That's the stuff that um, the American Red Cross did, text uh, 
save people to this text number and that'll donate ten dollars to that that stuff or uh, another great example of it is um, uh, American um, uh, damn it I can't remember the name of the TV show that does uh, Simon Cowell is on it I'll American remember Idol. American Idol thank <laughs> you Nicole I appreciate it American Idol uses text messaging a lot mobile websites another important thing mobile ads where you're going in and you're visiting a website and an ad pops up Bluetooth marketing which is where you go in and basically know that somebody's nearby if any of you have LinkedIn on your mobile phone I'd encourage you to put it on your mobile phone next time you are in uh, in proximity to somebody who also has LinkedIn on their mobile phone, you can just bump the phones together and it will transfer the information across uh, uh, your Bluetooth connection. Geolocation, where you can figure out where people are based on where, where them having their phone on. Augmented reality, QR codes, which are codes basically we've seen them on magazine ads lately. Even mobile applications, those are not going away. Those are things that are here to stay. So the bottom line is you can use all these things. One of my favorite are QR codes. And if you scan this QR code right now that's on the screen right now, it'll take you through to a specific page on the 60 Second Marketer mobile website. But the bottom line is Smithsonian Institution used it recently. QR codes to enhance the experience of people at one of their exhibits. Real estate agents can use it. Hey, put it on the sign out in front of the house. If people aren't there, they can get a YouTube video tour of that house by scanning the QR code. Restaurants use it. I want to get additional information on the health benefits of this food. In-store promotions, instruction manuals have them in there. Even events have them. So it's a great use of mobile media. There are other tools that are out there, too. As I mentioned a minute ago, LinkedIn. Amazon has a great tool where you can go in and basically take a picture of a product in a store using the Amazon application and it'll tell you, hey, we know what that product is. We actually can have it shipped to your house for $10 less in two days if you can be patient enough for us. Amazon's really changing the world with that. The bottom left-hand uh, quadrant there is uh, Foursquare, another tool that people are using more and more of, and then even Yelp is a great tool. Yelp has a terrific new application out where you can go in, turn on Yelp on your uh, smartphone. If you're in New York City and you've never been there before and you're interested in a good restaurant, you hold up your smartphone, look down the street, and live through your viewfinder, it shows you what's lo what street you're looking down and it'll point out which restaurants are there, which one's the Italian restaurant, which one's the Indian restaurant, which one's the Chinese restaurant, along with their ratings. And then you just press the button through your viewfinder and it'll give you access to the ratings for that new stuff. Cool, cool stuff coming down the pike on all that. Really, really fascinating stuff. Um, again, my name is Jamie Turner. I'm with the 60 Second Marker, which is the online magazine for BKV Digital and Direct Response. As I mentioned, this presentation can be downloaded at 60secondmarketer.com slash PDF. Be sure that you put uppercase P, uppercase D, uppercase F. I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to answer a couple of questions here because we've got a couple of questions coming in that uh, that uh, that are that are coming in the transom right now. The first question is, how much time does it take to do a successful social media campaign? I get asked that question an awful lot. And the bottom line is, if you're a small organization, 25% to 50% of a full-time employee's time is going to be needed in order to get traction on the social media front. Do not delegate it to somebody who's not interested in social media. Do not delegate it to somebody to do in their spare time. It won't happen. If you're a larger organization, you're going to want 50% a full-time employee, even a team of employees, managing your social media campaign in order to do it. Now that you know how to measure the success of a social media campaign, you can go in and justify the expense of somebody behind it. Most people are sitting around going, well, we don't even know if we're making any money with this thing. How can we put more staff against it? And that's because they're not doing the things that we that that we know now how to do on all of this stuff. Um, by the way, we will be uh, uploading this hopefully later so that people can uh, can watch it again later, or you can have your associates watch it. Uh, one other question on uh, that we have is uh, I've got uh, where should I start with social media? What what's the fundamental thing? I would always encourage people to go to that hub and spoke model that we talked about a minute ago. That hub and spoke model is basically a great way to go in and say, all right, we're going to start with a blog and an e-newsletter as our main hub, and then the spokes coming out are our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, our LinkedIn group, or our LinkedIn profile, and our Twitter handle, and start with that fundamental model, and always drive people through to a landing page where you, they can download more information so that you can capture that lead and remarket to them in the future, and all of that 
uh, works out well. Uh, we've got a question from Chad. Does the responsibility for social media communication strategy make more sense to reside in a creative marketing department or a customer service department? That's a great question. It's a loaded question. Um, I would put it in the marketing department um, overall. Well, Chad, I'm going to answer it this way. Customer service, of course, you, you, it should be a team of people that have those two disciplines divided up. So, for example, if you're going to use Twitter as a way to track what people are saying about your brand, let's say you're Delta Airlines, and you know that Delta wants to know what people are saying about losing their bug baggage. Can we reach out to those people and connect with them and save them from going to a competitor of ours? You're going to want somebody in customer service to be in charge of that aspect of your social media campaign. However, for most of it, on your outbound stuff where you're trying to generate content that gets eyeballs to your website or your landing page, you're going to basically want to have people in your marketing department handling that. Another very common question that I get is, should social media be handled on the client side, on the corporate side, or should it be handled by the agency, an ad agency we're working with? And the bottom line for that is a lot of it needs to be handled inside on the client side because it happens so rapidly. It happens so quickly. Now, BKV works with Equifax in depth on their social media campaign as well as doing work for AT&T on the social media front and even the Home Depot on the social media front. But they basically handle a lot of the stuff internally, those clients. But we handle the metrics. We handle the strategy. We handle the tracking. We handle all the stuff that shows whether or not this is working or not working for them because we've got the analytics tools inside of BKV to handle that kind of stuff. So great question, Chad, and I kind of went off on a tangent there, but that's the bottom line on it. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. My name, again, is Jamie Turner. I'm the author of How to Make Money with Social Media. I work for BKV. I go out and I talk about this stuff everywhere because large corporations come in and they say, hey, we want to talk with you a little bit further about what BKV does. BKV can take a dollar and generate 10, 11, 12, 13, even $19 in one particular case in terms of the return on investment across a lot of different things, whether it's direct response TV, direct mail, social media, mobile media, email marketing, you name it. That's a little plug for BKV, but reach out to me if you want to hear more about BKV. Again, my name is Jamie Turner. Thank all of you for joining us today. Ask me any questions you want via email. You've got my email address there, jamie.turner at bkv.com. And I want to thank everybody for joining us, and we will see you next time.